Well, good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be joined by two fantastic musicians who are very closely associated with uh, Deal Music and Arts, and they are the wonderful violinist Michael Foyle and the astonishing pianist Maxim Sturer. Um, welcome, Michael, and welcome, Maxim. Hello, Paul. Hello, Maxim. It's well, great to be here. Well, you're both very much valued here in Deal, and you've been coming here for some time. And I think you sort of somehow see Deal as a bit of a sort of second or third home. When did it all begin? I think the first time we came and played as a duo was the year 2015. And we did a, a lunchtime recital around the world in 80 minutes sort of sort of thing, which is, I think, also connected with the educational side of Deal Festival, with which we've been continually associated ever since. So we, we were taking pieces for violin and piano that took us right around the different uh, genres of classical music and also all the different lands from which the great uh, masterpieces appear and introducing them for hundreds of school children. I, I mean, you do have a very eclectic taste in music, both of you. Uh, and you're you're willing to try anything and everything, right from the the classics, the the great classics, through to a lot of contemporary music. Uh, Maxim, I know you're a composer as well. Is that one of the things that drives you as well in the, in that aspect? Well, to an extent, I must say, um, I haven't actually uh, written actively any new music for a while now, uh, possibly because of my involvement in uh, research, uh, which. Um, focuses on 20th and 21st century music. So, um, but definitely uh, playing um, works from all sorts of eras and all sorts of styles and genres has been very important. I think it's, um, um, obviously there are people who feel strongly about focusing on a particular composer, for example, or a particular time period that they've, be it 19th century music, be it the Viennese classics or be it the 20th century music. Um, some people feel particularly, some performers feel particularly strongly about performing just those works, but I think it's important to keep an open mind. Now in 2015, am I right in saying that you were two of the sort of youngest members of the City Music Foundation? Yes, the City Music Foundation had just started and they're a wonderful young artist platform that fosters and, and nurtures young um, professional musicians. So, um, yeah, we've been very lucky to have done some wonderful projects uh, through the City Music Foundation, including a tour of Mexico in 2017. Um, that, was, that was one particular highlight. And, I mean, they do promote artists to do unusual things, don't they? They, they, they support artists in approaching things from quite different uh, directions as well to make you very rounded musicians to cope with the music world as we know it is. Yes, a very important part of uh, the City Music Foundation's activity is actually holding a series of uh, workshops for all their artists where we are um, tackling some of the issues that perhaps um, probably now more, now more so than a few years ago, but uh, which are very important for young musicians, something that has to do with uh, promotion, with marketing, but not only, also some, something that has to do with how to best do a pre-concert talk and uh, you get to practice doing that in front of your peers, you get feedback. So, and a lot of those things that the CMF does is, uh, I think, very instrumental. It's a part of this, um, the musician's toolkit nowadays. Yes, because a musician now can't just be a musician, can they? They have to have so many other strings, so, sorry to use the phrase, so many other strings to their bow, but they literally do, don't they? I mean, Michael, you're uh, life as a musician encompasses such a variety of things. I mean, what, what do you both normally do? There's a, that dreadful question that people say to musicians, and what do you do for your day job? But in actual fact, you do have other day jobs, usually in teaching or recording or uh, rehearsals, performing, a whole range of things. What would they, what, Michael, tell me a little bit about a sort of an average day that you might have. Or a sort of there, there is, I think there is no such thing as an average day, <laughs> to be honest. I think, you know, the, the performing uh, element is, is, the, is the main thing. So when it's taken away, as we see now in, the, in this lockdown period, what is left, it becomes, the, becomes quite um, relevant to our, you know, general fulfillment and existence. So for me, in this period, the main thing has been working with my students at the Royal Academy of Music, of course, at a distance. Um, which is very unusual, but somehow we still managed to get a lot of good work done. I think the interesting thing in this whole process has been 
just it has been brought home so clearly to both I think the students and to me that the thing we are interested in mostly is the material itself the music itself the compositions themselves of course if we like each other it's an advantage but you know we don't have any atmosphere when we work by zoom we have only the material itself and that's a great meeting point I think it's incredibly liberating when we realize it's not about they're not coming for me as such they're coming to deal with this material and I'm also excited mostly by the material and that's our meeting point which brings a great openness and I would say we're used to performing and there's an intensity and a, an energy that you have only on stage yes. that's sure but there is an intimacy that comes with this um, teaching process and I think it's wonderful to be part of that lineage you know we're, we're so um, indebted and so so I would say inspired by our past and by our teachers and so we're connected with our past but also with the future and we can pull this material forward a little bit or the thinking about the material the thinking about the technique all well, gets pulled forward even by zoom we can do this work so there's something there's something very satisfying about that and I, I think that with both of you demonstrates your your commitment to music education I know you're both a very profoundly supportive and interested in that and I know you you are the joint directors of our new sounds program um, do you like to just, for those who might not know about New Sounds, just give a sort of an insight as to what the sort of chief aims are of New Sounds and what it does? Well, one of the great things about uh, New Sounds is that it uh, really opens the music up to uh, children who do not, well, perhaps some of them probably will eventually, but most of them uh, will not have music as their primary focus in their lives. So, uh, and yet they benefit uh, from being able to play with each other. And I think especially the ensemble activity and exploring music, which would not otherwise be part of the curriculum, I think is very important. So yeah, there's, there's been a lot of emphasis on music for the 20th century, on our past new sound projects. We did uh, works by Lutoslavsky, for example, the chain, which we did in Deal Castle. That was, that was a fun project. And yeah, well, that, so, that, that, that was a fun project because we were literally traveling around the castle, weren't we carrying marimbas with us and things like that. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> absolutely. It, 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 was a, it was a logistical feed as well as a musical feed, but in any way, I think, uh, it's 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 great to show these uh, young musicians uh, what sometimes is involved in making music, and I have to say I remember they all did marvelously, both in performing I think, and. I think one of one of my favorite projects with the New Sounds Ensemble was when we were we started off the evening with Maxime, myself, and Raphael Lang playing the Ravel Trio, so just three of us on the stage, and then we gradually scaled up and scaled up, and we finished the evening with a work of yours, Paul, a very extravagant and immersive and very inclusive joyful um large ensemble piece which involved all of the all of the young musicians and i think an evening like that was for me a very inspiring thing to do you know working of course as a close-knit professional group but you know expanding and expanding until it felt like the whole <laughs> the whole of deal was on the stage you know and and i don't know there was something very i don't know exactly the word but very warm-hearted and uh, generous about this kind of way of sharing music well we had we had a lot of fun i mean it, and i think sadly uh, very often the music of our time is the music that is most ignored because there is a sort of perception that music of our time is really not very beautiful but it can be can't it it can be very beautiful very moving very emotive uh, and it says something about our time. And when we consider the extraordinary situations that are going on at the moment in a host of ways, it is going to be the arts that are going to be reflecting that most obviously, whether that's in literature, music, painting or whatever. Mm, definitely. I think, you know, I think it was between 1800 and 1870, 80 percent of the compositions that were played on stage in London, Leipzig, Paris, Vienna, were by living composers, 80%. Gosh. And now, in these same cities, 80% is, is by the same composers. <laughs> yeah, they're dead. You know, it's really, I think it's something for us, you know, certainly Maxim and I really try to do this to, like we were saying, in order to bring the art form forward, we have to engage the living composers, the young minds, and, um, if we don't support the young composers, who will, you know? And this is, this is an essential part of the process of keeping it alive, I think. Now, obviously, we could go into details about how lockdown has affected all our lives. I think for composers, it's probably a, a period of intense luxury 
when they can concentrate. But for performers, it's, it's not, is it? It's a, it's a challenge to deal with it. Maxime, how, how are you dealing with, you know, a lot of your music making is, is done with others as a pianist. You have a vast repertoire of solo piano music, but are you finding frustrations that you'd like to be making music and that physical relationship with, with musicians that's so profound? Well, I feel that firstly, I, I really have to say that I, I consider myself uh, very fortunate in this kind of situation. And I know how hard this has been for so many people. I mean, obviously my thoughts go out to those people who are actually on the front line of this crisis, uh, the workers of healthcare sector all around the world who are actually um, maybe have been a little bit undervalued by many countries. And now we are realizing how essential these are and not just the healthcare workers, also people who work in supermarkets, uh, food chain, everything. And um, even those who haven't been affected by the virus itself, of course, have been affected by the various economic implications of it. Now, in terms of um, your question about the um, activity, again, I have to say that I have been quite fortunate because this, this time um, of not having too many concerts has given me a very unique opportunity to actually finish my doctoral thesis at the Royal College of Music. And as a matter of fact, I actually submitted it on Friday. So you wouldn't, you might not have been able to do that had you had all your concerts. This is, this, is, this is so true because, you know, when I, I, I love doing research and I love reading, I love uh, in, in, I mean, engaging with uh, the subject of my research. But when you constantly have an intense performing schedule, it's hard. Yep. It's hard to manage everything. Of course, yes, you do a little bit of teaching as well. So it, I kind of took a deliberate decision in these two months to really focus my efforts on completing the work I have been doing for six years of my life. It's rather embarrassing to admit that, but yeah, and, and now that it's done, I really feel that it's, you know, um, it's, it's a great silver lining. Uh, Michael, how, how, because you, you've been one of those musicians that's been leading orchestras, doing solo recitals, being the soloist in many concertos, you've, your schedule, is one that when you show me what it's like, it looks like one of these extraordinary uh, ambassadors for whatever it is, UNESCO or whatever, who's traveling around the world and you're never in the same country for more than two or three days. Uh, it's very different, isn't it? It is. I, w I had a fortunate start to the year because I had such an intense um, range of travel. Um, I was in Canada, uh, I, w I went from there to Moscow and then to the Netherlands. So there was so many exciting projects and concerts going on in January and February that I think when it hit in March, I was able just to sort of take a moment to reflect um, on, on, you know, and, I, and kind of still fresh with all of that inspiration. But now, of course, after these months, um, of course, uh, confirming everything that Maxim has said about how important it is that we value public health above everything else. But at the same time, of course, I think we have to find a way to keep this music alive. That's that's critical. These two things have to go hand in hand. So I've been alongside the teaching I've been preparing as Maxim will now be as well, now that he's finished his PhD, the um, 10 Beethoven sonatas yep. for piano and violin for a recording that's going to take place in July in Belgium. Fingers crossed we can go ahead with that. It looks very likely so i've had a good time as well being immersed in this music which i think there's something about beethoven i don't know of course it's his anniversary year but there's a way that he can speak to us in these times that just just unlike any composer i think you know someone said i don't even remember who said it but you know mozart seems to speak to us from the heavens you know it's this absolutely pure perfectly written manuscripts without corrections just something like like this and Beethoven it's the other way around it's man crying to the heavens you know yes. with all of the emotion and frustration and angst of course moments of great transcendent beauty and cathartic uh, peace you know but there's this struggle always always a struggle and I think I was just practicing now the finale of the seventh sonata this dun 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 all these repeated notes yeah repeated notes I, I learned repeated tones you both know about this more than me were banned in music, you know, for hundreds of years until Monteverdi came along and wrote these repeated tones. And the orchestra said, you know, we've never done, we're not allowed to do this. We can't, do, we can play different tones, dum, bum, 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 or we can play one long note, but we can't repeat the same tone, dum, 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 bum, 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 bum. And Monteverdi said, there is no way to express anger and frustration in music without these repeated tones. Yeah. And I think, you know, Beethoven is a master of this. He's of course, fighting with this deafness and this feeling of being in chains, you know, trying to trying to break free. 
I think it's something that we as musicians used to traveling and used to, yeah, of course, as Maxim said, respecting everything that's going on and the, and the genuine hardship for a lot of people, we still feel that, you know, we have to get out there and share this music. And I think Beethoven can express this, this desire and frustration and kind of longing to, to get back into the thick of life uh, very, very well. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a massive project, isn't it, to record all the, all the Beethoven sonatas. Um, but you're right about the, the, the manuscripts, those original manuscripts, because people think that they are often very beautiful. But Beethoven's original manuscripts are a complete mess, aren't they? The, the writing is like a sort of spider over the page with crossings out and rubbings mm. out and bits, you know, everywhere. Uh, mm. Have you actually consulted any of those? I shouldn't ask you this one because you might not know because the additions are all so clear and the, the various things that are there. But when you do, do you find it quite an interesting thing when you go back to those original manuscripts and you see what was what was on originally on the yeah. page? That's how I've seen the, the, the Spring Sonata manuscript in the National Library in, in Austria, in Vienna, and that is an interesting one, the Spring Sonatas, because it's totally without corrections. The first page is in this beautiful, as they were, this landscape format, mm -hmm. um, and it's just written as if it comes just straight out of his, flowing out of his, his pen or his heart or, you know, wherever it comes from without corrections. That's a very interesting one to see in to see in Vienna because it's it's a, a rare example I would say of untroubled Beethoven. Yes, but not so many of those are there, Maxime. Well, um, some of the manuscripts are available. Of course, uh, now we live in a rather fortunate time where we can access them in lots of very good facsimile editions, and yes. these are actually also available online. So, yeah, as I, I have been looking at a fair uh, number of these manuscripts of a lot of these sonatas, and uh, at the Royal College, fortunately, we also have a few. Um, we have also some of the uh, first edition copies of um, the violin sonatas. I was looking at number ten, first edition. So yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting uh, um, process to especially to compare uh, what kind of evolution work undergo undergoes uh, from the stage of the manuscript to the stage of the first edition. And then um, it's interesting to see that uh, first editions do not often actually have the finalized text and uh, uh, then the composers make uh, more corrections yes. and in subsequent editions in a way they, if they have been they, they have been checked by the composer we can find um, something which uh, is more authentic I mean of course there is a lot of argument around this whole notion of uh, authenticity and to what extent we can recreate the both the atmosphere the environment and the perception of the works as they were seen and heard back in those days and of course there's we we have a wealth of evidence we have uh, all sorts of eyewitness accounts and we've we've got people's letters we've got uh, uh, some of the uh, printed press and all these all these things help us kind of breach that gap but to an extent it's still a little bit of a speculation i mean we're still it's 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 in our imagination so in a way it's a fantasy what well, the authenticity is a fantasy now Last year, you were busy recording, uh, you did two CDs. Uh, one was about the Great War, uh, music from that period, which included Debussy, Janacek, uh, Respighi, the Respighi Sonata, which we very rarely hear, beautiful, extraordinary work, and also a, a new work by Kenneth Hesketh, which was reflecting on that. And then you, you recorded the complete music for violin and piano by uh, Witold Lutoslawski and Krzysztof Penderecki. And Penderecki, has died this year. So you were working, weren't you, with Penderecki on that? That's a rare thing, isn't it? Yes, we met Penderecki through the Park Lane Group, another wonderful young artist uh, platform. That was back in 2015, we met him. He came to London, he came to the South Bank Centre and we were exploring his, his um, chamber music. And he, yeah, he was a wonderfully warm and um, generous person in every way, you know, sort of a person of large proportions, large mind, large heart, large stomach, you know, but yes. his music had this kind of um, generosity to it. And I think we enjoyed very much exploring. It was a, it was definitely a way into this world for us. We'd been exploring Lutus Waski with his um, centenary project that the Philharmonia had, had run in collaboration with another great composer, living composer, but also sadly um, recently passed away, Stephen Stuckey yes. uh, from the States. He had curated this festival with the um, Philharmonia called Woven Words. That was our way into to, um, Lutoswaski's mu music with his partita and Subito. 
Um, and then we added to that the recitativo on Arioso. So those are his three works for violin and piano. And then with Penderecki, of course, we, we, we worked with him in, a, in the Purcell room and that got us going on his, his uh, writings for these instruments. Now we associate Penderecki particularly. Uh, I mean, I remember as a boy, um, I must have been about 14, 15, going into Lewis County Library and getting out records of his St. Luke Passion and Utrenia, the Entombment of Christ. And I just, that, the influence that the, that had on my musical life was more than profound. It changed the way I thought. And he is one of those rare composers. There's very few composers who we can say actually changed the future direction of music. So, uh, just as Beethoven has had. Uh, so to actually have had that input from Penderecki is very rare. We're not going to get that too often, are we? No, absolutely not, Paul. And uh, you're absolutely right in saying that Penderecki was absolutely instrumental in moving the music forward, probably from this uh, time of kind of over-intellectualization of the uh, 1950s and the Darmstadt School with uh, Luigi Nono and um, Carl Hans Stockhausen, and of course, the Pierre Boulez as well. And uh, when Penderecki wrote his Trinity for the Victims of Hiroshima, which uh, was completed in 1960, it, it, I mean, it really had a massive impact in its uncompromising modernism and use of clusters to communicate the pain and the incredible the intensity of emotion. But of course, um, already with St. Luke's Passion, which I believe was um, finished in 1966, he kind of went back into the, the rather conventional tonality. Of course, not, not, not entirely, but yeah, it was, it was a gradual movement away um, from the intensity and the uncompromised nature of modernism. And this is actually, it sort of created a bit of a, um, um, a bit of a dichotomy between these two composers, Lutislavski and Penderecki. I mean, Lutislavski um, uh, could never quite understand why Penderecki did not continue with this line. Of course, Lutislavski was uh, eventually responsible for creating the model of aleatoric yes. writing, in which uh, there is a certain mode of organization of instruments, but there is also quite a bit of a degree of freedom to, to how rhythmically and uh, execute certain passages, certain gestures. And that creates um, both a sense of structure and a sense of chaos and how they sort of interact with one another. And uh, Penderecki went eventually into the in the direction of this uh, tonality, which linked him to Shostakovich in a lot of um, maybe in a lot of ways. And uh, on our CD, when we were working on his uh, very large-scale work, the second sonata for violin and piano, which was um, written right at the end of the 20th century, and uh, you could really feel that there are his trademark clusters in the beginning and at the end of the very kind of pivotal moments in the in the narrative of the piece, but um, some of the movements, such as the slow movement, the adagio, it really, um, there's, there's more than a hint of C minor and, uh, there. And indeed, can... indeed. But Paul, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Paul, we, we had this chance to work with Lutislavski, but uh, with Penderecki, but you had the chance to work with Lutislavski, is that not right? Did you not meet I, I, him? Well, I did, I did, yes. I mean, what a lovely man. I, it, was quite, it was quite a funny situation because it was when I was a student at the Royal College, and he came to give a masterclass. <clears throat> and my work was one of the chosen works. And I, it was a big piano sonata that there was going to be played. And the room, this large room, what, what is now the library, the downstairs library of the RCM, at that time was, was slightly differently placed. And um, uh, they couldn't find the key to the piano. <laughs> so the, the pianist was ready to play this huge work, Lutislavski, we were ready. The audience was waiting with bated breath nothing was played. So all that was happened was we just had this discussion about a piece of paper or, or these pe sheets of paper, which I found incredibly useful. I thought, what a lovely man, but nobody had a clue what it sounded like. So uh, one, of those, one of those moments, which we, I think we'll all remember in very different ways. But mm -hmm. he was a very, very lovely chap. And I do also remember getting to know Penderecki when he came to Canterbury and we, we had the St. Luke Passion there. And um, both mighty figures in 20th century music and the way in which music has moved forward in the ways that it has, both really charged with creating or being two of the chief creators of what's known as the Polish school of music and Polish notation. But actually, although there are similarities and you talk about these clusters and these, these clusters where you've got lots of notes together that, have, that are literally uh, next adjacent to each other's in semitones, their music is very differently put together, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, um, and it's interesting to see how you kind of, um, um, I think probably it's uh, also about the interaction between these composers and the authorities in Poland. I mean, um, actually both of them were involved in um, um, managing structures as well as creative industries. Lutosławski was actually elected in 1945 as the president uh, of the Polish Composers Union. Um, and, but of course, um, um, more and more uh, in those uh, ensuing years, he suffered from the um, kind of Im the, the uh, era of Stalinist censorship being kind of imposed on composers. And, um, but when Stalin died in 1953 um, and Khrushchev replaced him and it, the, the, the period uh, from then onwards is known as the Khrushchev thaw. So uh, a lot of composers um, uh, felt that they could um, really explore the styles that they weren't allowed to explore before. So that was a, that was a very important thing. Uh, and uh, of course, um, we know that it led to the establishment of the festival, such as the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw Autumn Festival, which um, uh, Ludoslavsky was very much connected with. Now, um, when we talk about Ludoslavsky and Penderecki, it might give the impression that this music is extremely hard to deal with. It's not at all, is it? It's, it's, the Lutislavsky's music is extremely beautiful and beautifully crafted. And Penderecki's music can be, either in the late works, extremely romantic, or in the earlier works, extremely dramatic. Um, we're going to provide the links to uh, your CDs so that people can, uh, can either hear them on Spotify or even better still, buy them. Because if you buy them, you can get um, the one in even the best sound possible on SACD, which of course is playable on all CD players, I should add. Um, but and some, uh, great, uh, some great sleeve notes as well. Exactly, and nice photographs on the covers too. <laughs> um, but we're gonna provide links to a few of the performances that you've got available on YouTube. Um, and one of those is Lusislavsky's Partita. So when people are listening to that, uh, it, it's quite a substantial work, isn't it? What, what should they be listening out for, Michael? Yeah, it's five movements. Um, he took the Baroque structure of a partita, but incorporated, as Maxim referred to earlier, this aleatoric quality. He called it limited aleatorism because he actually wrote the parts out, but they have to be played um, every time differently. So you, you start and you finish ideally together, but the time in which you perform your individual parts should be always slightly different. So you're de desynchronized. So you have this wonderful contrast between these three main movements of incredibly Baroque influenced structure and polyphony with this otherwise quite free ad libitum uh, section. So it's, a, it's just a piece to dive into and enjoy it as if it's a great you know short story that you open and you just trust that it's gonna take you in this exciting journey, I would say. And we're also going to, I, I have to share um, the Prokofiev Sonata Number no. 2, because I think it's one of the most beautiful and sunniest pieces uh, that Prokofiev wrote. Uh, we often hear it in its guise as a flute sonata. But, but Maxim, could you just introduce us to that work? Well, it's uh, like you said, Paul, um, he originally wrote it for flute and then uh, David Oistrach was uh, so fond of the music that he said, well, you, you can't possibly not make a violin version out of it. So, and actually Oistrach was in a way instrumental in editing that violin version. So qu quite a lot of um, writing, uh, we, can, we can see that it's uh, written by Prokofiev and it's Prokofiev's music, but um, it's incredibly idiomatic for the violin. It's not easy to play because Oistrach obviously was an absolutely outstanding and genius performer and a great master of his instrument. But um, yeah, the, the, the work, um, despite being written in 1940s, so it's actually, um, it's, it, was, um, it was a war piece in a way. Uh, it was written during World War II. But uh, yeah, it's got this wonderful lyricism. And um, the third movement, for example, is influenced by jazz music to an extent, which Prokofiev, of course, was very much exposed to as he stayed in Paris and in the United States in uh, early in the 1920s. So uh, there are a lot of influences there. And there is also this um, influence of uh, Russian folk tunes, which uh, Prokofiev uh, knew and loved. So um, yeah, those four movements, and there is a, there is a lovely scherzo, which is the second movement. Um, now, going back to this, um, the, the, the category of folk music and folklore, that was very important for Prokofiev. And he always was fascinated with the concept of a fairy tale. 
So they kind of juxtaposition between reality and uh, kind of uh, the surreal quality of a fairy tale, which has very relatable characters in a way which are at the core of the nation's sort of psychological, um, maybe idea of themselves, you know, in this case, it's, uh, well, what we know as the Russian nation. And uh, so of course, it's, it's a very complex heritage there. But yeah, and then, and then there is the sense of this kind of almost magical story which kind of always tends to work out. And some of the archetypes in, the, um, in those fairy tales, I think, uh, found their way into Prokofiev's music. So, so yeah, it's a fascinating piece. I, I would add to that that the start of the third movement of that sonata seems to um, bring back his music for Cinderella, just yeah. like Max was saying for this ballet. It's, you know, this one, this like winter fairy movement of Cinderella. And the second movement, Maxim talked about the scherzo, I think, it could only be Prokofiev in its sarcasm and wit and fire. And I think for people who are maybe encountering Prokofiev for the first time, they should absolutely read his diaries, which are just so theatrical, you know, like he, a meeting with a publisher that he describes, he, he could be writing the choreography for a ballet russe, you know, it, they're just so explosive and, and fiery and, and exciting to read. So I think, you know, again, the, the the best way to listen to this music is also to, to read a little bit of his diaries. Read around it. Now we're, we're running out of time and we're going to provide a link to your uh, movement of the, it's the Kreutzer Sonata, isn't it, that's uh, on online? Is that right? Yes, I'm sure it is. Is it the Kreutzer? Yes, yeah, the that's Kreutzer. Right. It shouldn't really be called the Kreutzer Sonata, should it? <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to also include a link to uh, the Tchaikovsky uh, piano trio, which you, uh, because when you spoke about, Michael, you came and, 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 and you played uh, the trio with uh, the cellist Raphael Lang. And we're going to ha have the link and access to the Tchaikovsky. So I think we've got exactly three minutes and 50 seconds left. So, so touching about on two minutes, can you just introduce us to the Tchaikovsky? I would just start by saying that he wrote it to the memory of a great artist who was his friend Nikolai Rubinstein and it was difficult for Tchaikovsky to write this because this was somebody who he held in high regard and it's music of utmost sincerity. If people say that Tchaikovsky is hysterical or you know over the top or bombastic then that's the fault of the performer. This is music of incredible sincerity. His musical god was Mozart and he is writing in a most personal and highly intellectual way. His nanny called him Petit Pushkin because he knew all of the great literature. You know, of course, we know from his operas, Eugene Onegin, you know, this was a very highly intellectual man. So this trio is indeed highly emotional, but it's music of great emotional sincerity, not hysteria. Yeah. I would also add to that that uh, when Tchaikovsky wrote this, one of the reasons he struggled with the concept of writing a trio is he actually he didn't quite believe that the three instruments can blend together. And uh, his longtime supporter, Nadezhda von Meck, was actually behind the, um, the commission, so the unofficial commission of the trio, she, because she um, had a trio in her house in Florence. And as a matter of fact, um, in that trio, none other than the young Claude Debussy played the piano. So um, yeah, that, that was the group of musicians uh, who she wanted to have some music by Tchaikovsky for. So of course she asked Tchaikovsky to write the trio and he eventually did. And yeah, it's two huge movements, uh, the, the sonata, the sonata from the first movement and then theme and variations in the second, which is probably um, in terms of uh, sheer scope and emotional impact, some of the largest works written for it this combination. It is a huge piece, isn't it? I mean, it's symphonic in scale. Well, it, Michael, it, Max, Maxime, Michael, it's been a joy talking with you. Um, Michael, I think you're still in Scotland, aren't you? I am, yes, I'm still in the not quite frozen north. Uh, and Maxime, you're in London. No, actually I'm in Estonia. Well. You're in Estonia. You're in Estonia and I'm in Deal. So we've literally traveled the, uh, across Europe thanks to Zoom. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you both uh, here in Deal uh, in 2021 when you're coming to perform. Uh, and I think we might even be doing a, a visit to Deal Castle once again, but we're going to go elsewhere as well. So thank you so much for joining us and good luck with your Beethoven recording. Thank you, Paul. Enjoy your summer. And you too. Thanks, Paul. It's been great to be here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.